Here we go. All right, so we're born into a reality that we take for granted. We readily accept this idea that we have these five discrete senses, and what you actually see in front of you is what's actually happening. But every now and then, we get these little hints that maybe our reality isn't as robust as we've been led to believe. Take visual illusions, for example. We've all probably encountered these at some point. This is a particularly famous one called the visual drift illusion. And the more you stare at it, you'll start seeing these kind of little swirls and patterns and movements, but they're not actually there. And we take illusions like these to be kind of cute little parlor tricks of the brain. But when you take a step back, it should be a little bit disconcerting that what you're actually perceiving isn't actually happening. And it goes further than this. So I want you to watch this video, and I want you to watch the speaker's lips closely while you listen to the sound. Ba, 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 ba. Ba, 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 ba. Now I want you to close your eyes. Ba, 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 ba. Ba, ba, okay. ba, ba. So I'm glad that worked for, <laughs> I'm glad that worked for a bunch of you. Um, so it's not just that, it's not just visual illusions. There are all of these crazy, what are called psychophysical effects out there in neuroscience. So that was a particularly famous one called the McGurk effect. And it's one of my favorite effects in neuroscience. So the neuroscience literature is actually brimming with these types of effects, but we as a general public tend to not hear about them because they're not as easy to convey with a snappy picture or video. But there's just one more that I want to explain real fast to kind of take this all the way into the end zone. And it goes something like this. This was an experiment I did during my PhD. So imagine yourself out in a field on a nice quiet summer night with a friend, and you've brought with you a bunch of fireworks. So you wire up the fireworks a few hundred yards away to some sort of a trigger, and you press the trigger, and then all of a sudden you're engulfed in this spectacular audio-visual display represented by this beautiful public domain clip art. <laughs> so uh, you press the trigger over and over and over again until you've exhausted your supply of fun. Now, you're standing right next to your friend. You're getting practically the same exact light hitting your eyes, the same exact sound hitting your ears, all at practically the same exact time. But you're actually going to perceive things differently. So at the right distance, because you're the one pressing the button or the trigger, you're more likely to experience the sound and light from the fireworks as being simultaneous where your friend who's standing right next to you, getting practically the same input, is more likely to see the light before hearing the sound. So we need to throw out this idea that we have five discrete senses. What you perceive at any given point in time is this kind of far, far muddier amalgamation. What you're perceiving at any given point in time is a combination of the sensory input that you're receiving, the motor output that you're producing, and the summed history of your past perceptual experiences. So what enables this? Well, if you begin to scratch the surface and look at our underlying physiology, things begin to, for lack of a better term, make more sense. So all of our senses start with these special cells in our body called sensory receptors. And whether it's the receptors in your skin or the receptors in your inner ear, they all do the same exact thing. They all take some sort of information from the environment and they convert that information to these patterns of electrochemical signals, which then go to the brain. <laughs> and um, so that's all your brain ever gets. All your brain ever receives are these patterns of electrochemical signals. It doesn't necessarily care whether those signals are coming from the receptors under your skin or the receptors in your inner ear. It just gets these signals and it extracts patterns of meaningful information from them that give rise to your perceptions. And further still, your sensory receptors aren't intelligent themselves. They don't necessarily, they're designed for a particular type of information, but they don't necessarily care what that information is. 
So if you start looking across the animal kingdom, we have a lot of evolutionary relatives and ancestors that have the same basic idea at play. They have some sort of a, some sort of a central brain, and they have these kind of peripheral sensory receptors that are also performing the same exact type of function. But what you see is this rich diversity of senses. So for example, you have fish that can sense the electromagnetic fields in their immediate surroundings. You have snakes that have these heat pits that enable them to sense in the infrared. And you have birds that have magnetite that enable them to sense the Earth's magnetic fields. And the list goes on and on and on. So taking a step back, what if it's the case then that all Mother Nature ever had to do was evolutionarily design one blueprint for what a brain is and does, and all of our peripheral sensory receptors are merely these plug-and-play devices. So I have to give credit to my former PhD advisor, uh, Dr. David Eagleman, for coming up with this idea, and he calls it his PH, or potato head, model of evolution. <laughs> So if that's the case, if our receptors are these peripheral plug-and-play devices, that means we should be able to do some pretty weird things, like, say, taking information from one sense and mapping it to another sense. Um, and this is called sensory substitution. So this, is, this idea has actually been around in the neuroscience literature since like the late 1960s, and it was pioneered by this researcher, Paul Baki Rita. And what Baki Rita did was, in his lab, in this kind of landmark study, he took a dental chair, and he took a video camera, and he tied the feed from the video camera to this array of little pins that would poke you in the back in this dental chair. So he then took blind people, sat them in this dental chair, had them wave objects in front of the camera, and they'd feel the shape of those objects in their back. And with time and training, these participants started describing visual-like perceptions on their back. And fast forward to today, this device is called the brain port, and it operates on exactly the same principle, except here you have a video camera on your forehead, and the pixel information from the video camera gets mapped to an electrotactile grid on the tongue. But beyond sensory substitution, we should be able to give people entirely new senses, not just these natural senses that we've been accustomed to. So to that end, uh, during my PhD, David and I came up with this device that we call the Versatile Extrasensory Transducer, which is a bit of a mouthful. And that acronym is VEST, which, as the name implies, is a vest. Um, and the idea is you wear it on your torso, and it can take in whatever information that you want and map it to your sense of touch using vibration on your torso in low latency real time. So, I have our latest prototype here with me, and I have to give a lot of credit to our amazing team who have helped refine our prototypes over the last couple of years. Um, and so I'm going to turn this on, and there we go. So right now, the Vest is running our sound-to-touch sensory substitution system. So in real time, all of the sound from the environment is being passed through the smartphone, and then a mathematical representation is found of that that's mapped to your sense of touch. And the idea is to capture and convey enough information so that someone who has no sense of hearing can perceive sound with a good enough fidelity for understanding speech. So I'm just going to show you this in action real quick in a nice little video, because we all like snappy videos. Um, so this is uh, myself playing just a simple word training game with um, who's now our clinical coordinator. His name is Jonathan. He's 38 years old. He was born with no sense of hearing, considers himself deaf, never really used any hearing technology. So I'm just going to show this video of him learning four new words that he's never quote unquote heard before on the fly. OK, uh, let's try four new words. Um, I'll let you uh, pick. Play. Play. Work. Work. Play. Work. Sleep. Sleep. Eat, eat, sleep, work, work, play, 
eat, sleep, work, play, play, work, sleep, eat, play, play, sleep. Work, play, play, eat, work, sleep, eat. Play. <laughs> nice. So it's crazy like how immediately useful this technology can be. But beyond filling gaps in, say, sensory deficits, what we're really interested in is giving people entirely new senses. So just some classes of applications that we're thinking of, and this is by no means a limited set, are things like giving people super senses. For example, being able to hear out of audible human range, such as hearing like a dog, or feeling real-time streaming data from the stock market or the internet, and maybe with the right kind of data feeds and enough time and training, you start to develop in a perception of maybe the global state of geopolitical affairs. And then there's my favorite class of applications, which is the idea of feeling what it's like to be another complex system. So say you're an airplane pilot and an airplane's constantly taking all these measurements about the state of itself. Well, what if you take that information and you jack it into your torso and given enough time and training, you begin to develop a perception of what it's actually like to be the plane flying through the air. And these are all things that our, kind of, our group is kind of dabbling around in right now. So this is us. We're at a stage where what we have is kind of something like the first personal computer. And I think there are a lot of interesting parallels that can be drawn from this. So like the first personal computer, it was before the spreadsheet application. It was before the World Wide Web. It was before the internet of things. And I think as soon as we unleash this technology on the public, there are going to be some serious creative geniuses out there who are going to come up with these mind-blowing applications that at this very point in time, we can't even fathom. And I think we'll also see something maybe like Moore's Law. So where Moore's Law was all about the computational power or the number of transistors on a processor increasing exponentially over time, right now on our vest we have these kind of 32 sort of clunky vibrational actuators. And so it's not inconceivable that over time, maybe the amount of information we can jack into our torsos will also increase exponentially. So given, new, uh, given advancements in energy storage and efficiency, manufacturing and assembly techniques that refine the process of integrating electronics into apparel, which is a very new thing, um, and maybe with further advancements in how we actually stimulate our sensory receptors. And I look forward to maybe just one day when we have something akin to a sensory skin on our body where instead of using this kind of clunky vibration, we're able to stimulate and programmatically control each of our individual sensory receptors. And that will be the day when we have not just true virtual reality skin, but entirely new realities being passed through our skin. And so having worked on this technology for ugh, just over five years. <laughs> um, and having reflected on it, I'm actually nothing short of an optimist about where this technology can go. So again, like the personal computer, I think what we have here is an incredibly empowering technology. So not just the ability to overcome whatever sensory deficits are thrown at humanity, but also we're talking about giving humanity direct perceptual access to all of this invisible information that's been floating around our universe. So taking humanity to the next level. And again, 
like the computer, what we have is something that's accessible. This technology doesn't require an expert to acquire or use. It's not composed of any rare or expensive components. So as this kind of technology gains adoption, just like we now have mobile devices in the pockets of the furthest reaches of human society, maybe to one day we'll have something on the furthest torsos of human society. And so with that, I hope I've left your minds reeling about what our sensory future might entail, and I encourage you to all think about how you want to not just enrich your senses, but give yourselves entirely new realities when the revolution comes. Thank you.